we have a fantastic speaker, uh, Melissa Namini, and we're really excited uh, to have her here today. And so uh, just a little bit about her. She is no stranger to the AUC, and I'm really excited to have her back along with us. So um, Dr. Namini, she is the lead data scientist at ADP. What's ADP? Always designing for people. At ADP, they design ways to work through cutting edge products, premium services, and exceptional experiences that enable people to reach their full potential from HR, talent, time management, benefits, and payroll. Their work is informed by data and of course, designed for and by people. She is the lead data scientist at ADP and is focused on planning projects and building data science models to help improve business decisions. In addition to that, she enjoys volunteering as the head of education for analytics, which is an Atlanta-based nonprofit organization focused on creating a community of individuals empowered to pursue work in the data analytics field. She likes to provide new pathways to economic opportunities by offering a data, data analytics training and also certification programs. Now, just a little bit about her before she came to ADP. She enjoyed a tour here in the Atlanta University Center as an assistant professor of mathematics at, Clark, at Morehouse College. And then she became a senior data scientist at Warner Media. In her, also in her spare time, she is an instructor at the Data Science Academy at North Carolina State University, which is led by a friend of ours, Dr. Ray Levy. She earned her bachelor's degree in mathematics from the great Morgan State. And she earned her master's and PhD in applied mathematics from North Carolina State University. So great to have you here today to talk about love, data, and algorithms. Yes, thank you. That was such a great <laughs> introduction. I feel special now. So yes, uh, I'm glad you said the great Morgan State. So because <laughs> it is a great school. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can go over uh, the presentation that I have for you all today. So again, I'm going to be talking about can data help improve one's dating experience, love, data, and algorithm. So my presentation is going to be very straightforward. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, actually about my journey. I think Dr. Washington already kind of told you a little bit about that. Then we're going to go straight into our talk, which is going to be about talking about what is dating, how do people date, how do dating apps work, uh, dating, data dating and algorithm, are they a perfect match? And then I'm going to give you a sample of some TED Talks who are talking about the subject. And also at the end, kind of kind of wrap up, give you my final thoughts on data and dating. So um, I, as uh, Dr. Washington said, earlier, I have a pretty strong mathematical background. I got my bachelor's degree from Morgan State University, the great Morgan State in Baltimore, Maryland, and I got my PhD in applied mathematics from North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. I am currently a lead data scientist at ADP, where I fo mostly focus on working on NLP projects that have to do with chatbot, uh, word embedding, um, agent assist, and things of the sort. In my spare time, I volunteer for Athletics, an organization that is focused on helping uh, the most vulnerable in the area, the Atlanta region, and I'm the head of education there, where we have a data analytics bootcamp to provide for these people that we want to target. So um, my journey uh, really in data science started when I finished my PhD. That's when I learned all about you know, data science. So I was very much interested. So I decided that when I was gonna go teach at Morehouse College, uh, which I really enjoyed, I was gonna focus most of my research uh, with students on the data science. So to learn more about the subject, I took some courses on course Coursera and things of the sort. And I also signed up for a, a workshop at Brown University uh, through ISERM, where they put together women from academia and people from the uh, corporate world to work on the applied data science problems. So after that, I realized that, wow, there's just too much there is to know about this field of data science, and I cannot learn it on my own. And I wanted to do it very quickly. So I decided that I was going to go ahead and take a bootcamp called Thinkful, where I was going to learn all the different sides of data science. I also used my student advisement 
to learn about data science. I had a project with one student. My first project was classification with super vector machine, where the student was more interested in finding ways to predict the stock market. Then um, I had also the chance to work on a research experience with some freshmen, where we had a applied, applied data science project all about the base rule. Now, of course, I was able to transition to Warner Media. Uh, in 2019, in August in 2019, because I felt that I wasn't being challenged as much as I needed to. There's so much more that I needed to learn and grow so that I can go to the corporate world, learn as much as I can, and possibly come back to academia. That would be my preference. So I also started then working at athlete, uh, volunteering at least at athletics, because I felt that, you know, since uh, there was so much to learn, I wanted to work on projects that had nothing to do with what I was doing at work. So that's one of the reason why I joined athletics. And while I was there, since I was talking all the time about my love for teaching and how I love to teach, um, you know, in 2021, you know, I was then put as in charge of the education program. And that's around the same time too, I started working at ADP. So that's a little bit about me. So I'm going to go ahead and go into my presentation, right? What is dating? And uh, exactly. So I first wanted to talk about the evolution of romantic relationship over the years. So in the 1700s, when people get were getting married, their purpose for that was to gain to just have children. Now, when you get to the 1800s, you realize that now the concept of getting married for love is just starting. Now, in the 1920s, the eras, you know, this is the big uh, Gatsby era. That's when the idea of date actually began. In the 50s, you have going steady. And then in the 60s and 70s, you now start having people living together, couples living together without getting married. They are just thinking the wedding is going to come soon. So they start already living together. Now, in the now, when you come to the 1980s, uh, in the 1980s, oh, okay. <laughs> In the 1980s, you have less formal dating. And then in the 1990s, then you get internet dating. And currently we are in the phase or where the 2000s where dating apps are very much accepted. So what is the most accepted definition for dating? So basically it is a stage of your romantic relationship when two people engage in activity together. So the purpose is to evaluate each other, to find out if you fit and if you have a future in an intimate relationship together. It's basically in your relationship stage, is basically in the courtship stage, stage where you have to go to different events to get to know each other and to meet your friends and family. So according to the Pew research, how do people meet? So most of the people that we know, 32% of the people meet through friends and family, 18% meet at work, 17% meet in school, and we have about 12% of people who have met their partner online. So now that we have kind of like a definition of, you know, dating and, you know, kind of like evolution of marriages and things like that. Now, I want to see how, what exactly do the data tell us about dating? So first thing that I want to mention here is that most of the research that I'm going to be presenting is going to be research that's based off of the, re the Pew Research, right? So this is data based off the Pew Research. And this data was only um, for the year 2019. So everything before 2019. So that's why this is mostly focused on the Me Too era, right? Because that's pretty much the big thing that happened then since it's 2020 when the COVID 19 happened. So it would be interesting to actually look at this data and see what are the what are the re results when we're looking at these things after COVID-19. So basically in the Me Too era, 65% of people actually believe that it is harder for men to know how to interact with women when they go on date, right? And then you have about 56% of single and looking women who are saying that they're having trouble finding people who are looking for the same kind of relationship and who have the same expectation that they have. Only 35% of men have have this problem. Now, I want to kind of look at the experience of all daters, and then I'm going to focus on the ones who are going online because that's where we can find data and give you more information about it. So all daters, now 
about 15% of Americans, adults who are single and looking for casual relationship. So what's going on with this 15% of American? So 75% of them find it uh, somewhat difficult to find people to date, okay? Then you have 66%, 67% who are saying that the dating life is just not going well at all. And then unfortunately, we have the statistic where 65% of women say that they have experience at least one of six harassing behavior. Now, when we are now, we know that the 1990s, that's when the dating, the internet era started. So how exactly has it been going now in the dating era? So now, overall, 30% of adults have actually used an online dating site or an app. Now, when you look at these people, 57% of those people are saying that the experience dating online has actually been positive. Now, 38% say that when they have gone online and they have had a romantic partner, they actually also look up information for that partner on the internet, basically. Now, what about these people who are having positive experience? I wanted to kind of focus on that because when you're dating, you want to have a positive experience. You don't want to date and find it somewhat difficult, right? So 63% of people who have a bachelor's degree or more have said that their experience has been somewhat positive to very positive online. Now, when you look at people who are making $75,000 per year, their experience online has been at least somewhat positive. That's about 17% people compared to those people who make less than 30,000. And then you have 65% of LGB users are more likely to say that their experience online has been very to somewhat positive. Now, one thing is that now we see that people who are online, basically they have a positive experience, but when they're online, what exactly do they want to see on this profile that of yours? So 63% of people believe that you should include what kind of relationship are you looking for? Do you want a casual relationship? Are you looking for a committed relationship or do you want to just have fun, right? Then 45% of those people want you to include the information about your children. So, and then you have about 36% want to know about your hobbies and interests and 25% of those people want to know about your religious belief. So this is a little bit about the data on the people that we have online when we look at the pure research that was done in 2019, the Me Too era. So now, now that we know that what's going on, I wanted to kind of focus on dating app because the dating app world, that's probably where most of the data science algorithm and the data science world will probably reside because the data will be uh, readily available to them. So I wanted to focus first on Tinder. Tinder is basically an app that has about 75 monthly, million monthly users. And when you look at the dating app worlds, it's actually the number one uh, dating app with the most paying customer with 51% of the share. The algorithm that they use is called the ELO rating system. And in this system, uh, actually, right now they're claiming that they are not using the system anymore, but the system basically adjusts who you see based on the people who you are liked or disliked. And then the order of these people then changes daily. Now, the next one you have is Bumble. In Bumble, you have about 45 million users, and then they have the number two share of paying customers, about with 32%. Here they use a swipe model where you swipe left and right if you like or dislike someone. But the one thing that is interesting about Bumble is that women have to message first. And they also use a private detector algorithm to make sure that nobody sends nude picture. Then we go into Hinge. Hinge has about 20 million users. And now the number really dropped here is number seven in the amount of pay customer. They use the Gale Shapely algorithm. And according to their spokesperson, this algorithm is supposed to spark deeper conversation between uh, the users and ultimately lead to great dates. 
And at the end there, I'm going to focus on Grindr. Grindr has about 11 million users. Of course, um, it has number eight here. When you look at the share of paying customer, I think it's very important to also look at those things because while they want us today, they also want to make money, right? Uh, they usually use location data uh, to pair people together. And they have this AI and automated decision-making system uh, that is basically used to sniff out accounts. So of all these different dating apps, how do they exactly match up people? So on Tinder, the way that they do to match people is that they recommend that the more that you use the Tinder, the more data they're going to get on you and the better recommendation they will be able to make for you. And this recommendation will be based off of your profile, who has seen it and who has liked it and things of the sort. On Bumble, you know, they, they tell you that basically when you get on Mumble, Bumble, you do not have to be afraid to get matched with somebody who hasn't been online. Basically, if someone hasn't been online for at least 30 days, their account becomes inactive. And one thing that they say is that every time that you match with someone, meaning a guy and a girl match, you have about 24 hours to respond. If not, the match will disappear. Now on Hinge, what they're going to do here is that you are not just matched because you swipe on some someone, right? It basically here, uh, you have people who are called your potential matches, and it's going to depend on how you interact with these potential matches. Basically, one thing again, like Tinder, Tinder, the more you use the app, the better the, gets, the app gets at matching you with the person that you are looking for. Then on Grindr, here basically is straightforward, right? Uh, this has to do with searches with people that are nearby. So when you open up the app, it's a basically of starting a search. Now, the search is not just going to be about any kind of person that's nearby you. It's actually going to also apply some preference filter that you have filled out before, meaning that relationship status and distance and things of the sort. So here is a bit of the different kind of um, algorithm and way that people get matched up using uh, dating apps. Unfortunately, not all dating apps actually share the algorithm that they use. Uh, they don't want other people to be able to replicate it and, uh, you know, take their business. So, but of course, as I can show here, Tinder and Hinge have kind of showed us what it is. So I'm going to focus on those two uh, going forward. Now we get in the algorithm part of love, right? So First, I'm going to focus on Tinder. So Tinder used the Halo rating system. So in this system, you have to understand that they look at dating as basically a dating tournament. The, the higher score you get, you will get matched with the higher scoring people. So you just have these people on the, on the app who want to get the high score so that they can get matched up. So usually you get matched up with people who have the same kind of store that you have. So how the Halo system the ELO system works. So this is a method that was used to calculate the relative skill level of players in a zero-sum game like chess. So the first thing that you have to understood is that you have two main formula. So your first formula here is the uh, probability of winning, right? Um, e of A or expected winning for player A, right? So this over here, you will think about it in Tinder, you will say is the um, probability that you're going to match with someone, right? Um, so over here, you have R sub B and R sub A. Those are the ratings of the uh, player. And this is calculated after each game. So here's the formula for the ratings. And you have S over here is your score. Um, is zero if you have lost, 0 0.5 if it was a draw, one if it's winning. So I'm guessing for Tinder is probably zero and one, zero if nobody match and one if somebody match, one of your potential match as match with you. Um, of course, they don't really share how it works. So I'm just speculating at the moment. Now, um, you know, you have your expected probability of winning and then you have K factor, which is basically uh, the constant maximum change that can happen during a game. So if you look at it, then really in the ELO rating system and on Tinder, everybody is pretty much represented by a, a bell curve. <laughs> so everybody is a bell curve because in this system, right, the standard deviation at the middle here of the of the 
of the bell curve is going to be actually your probability of winning. So as you can see here, you are a beginner, you are a novice, you are a dabbler, so or intermediate or strong and things different like that. So if you think about it, then you can think of everybody on Tinder as a person with a bell curve and people who have who haven't matched with many people yet have low bell curve and people who have matched with many people have high bell curve and only high bell curve people get together and low bell curve or medium bell curve. So this is kind of like a fun way to think about the ALO rating system and how it possibly can, can be used by uh, by Tinder. So basically then the purpose when you're on Tinder is to increase your score. So how exactly is that done? According to Tinder, they're saying that you have to show that you're a high value person, right? You are somebody with a high bell curve. And how do you show that you're a high value person? You have to behave like a high value person. You have to pro edit your profile, uh, update your bio, edit your photos and things like that. You have to respect others. And also, if we swipe on someone and you really like them, just swipe on those kind of people. Just don't swipe on any other random person on the app. OK, this is their advice. Also, they want you to engage fast with Tinder matches because it's really good for you. Of course, they also think that if you want to improve your app rank, you can pay in the app, which is another way for them to make money. Now, the next one that I want to talk about is the Gale Shapley algorithm. So in this algorithm, it's about finding your optimal match. So this is the algorithm that is used by Hinge. So in this case here, what happens is that uh, the algorithm is really not just by swiping left or having a high score, therefore I match with you, the woman and the men are going to interact and there's going to be something about do I like you, yes or no, and then you move on. So let's go ahead with this algorithm. So this algorithm was created to actually find the solution for the stable matching problem. I'm going to go ahead and kind of explain this algorithm using a preference list of men and women. So imagine you have about five men, five women, 10 men, 10 women, they are trying to get matched up. So what's going to happen is that at the beginning, you basically have an empty match. Nobody is matched up, right? Then you have this man who comes up to a lady and say, oh, yes, I like you. Uh, can we get together? Uh, the lady can say, if she's unmatched, then it becomes a match automatically, right? But then they will have to ask, do this lady like you, yes or no? If she prefers you, you guys stay a match. If not, she, you guys don't are not a match and she moves on. So it goes on like that forever until everybody is matched. So here is kind of like a gift that I found that kind of showcase this uh, Gale Shapley algorithm. So if you look at the first one, uh, Bingley, for instance, so you see that a few, he went to a few person, right? Charlotte and Lydia, both those ladies said, mm -mm, not interested. When he went to Jane, she was like, good, I'm, I'm going to stay here. Then uh, Darcy, for instance, went to Charlotte. Charlotte was like, no. But when Elizabeth came to him, she, when he went to Elizabeth, uh, she was like, good, and they matched up. So this is a little bit about how the Gale Shapley algorithm works. So basically, in Hinge, your purpose is then to find your most uh, the potential match, the best, the most compatible, compatible person to you. So how are you going to do that? Now, According to Hinge, to be able to do that, you have to be able to really consider the preferences that you have listed on your profile and in your settings, right? Then you have to look at what is the distance you are looking for, the gender, the identity, and many other things. Then it is also going to be based off of your recent likes and dislike. Then they have this thing called the standard tab, tab on the app where you're going to be able to find more information. So Hinge will then create information about people that they believe is most your type. Now, if you find one person there that is most your type, you are recommended to send them a rose or a like. Now, Hinge says that sending a rose is actually twice as likely to get you to a date. And you can see on the side there that actually sending a rose is actually money. So this could be also one way that uh, Hinge is using their app uh, to make money. Uh, and of course, uh, 
uh, how do they know this information about it twice as likely? Because most of the time, after you have matched up, they will send you a, a you have to tell in the app if you have met the person in the person in, in person, I guess, and then uh, you know, answer some survey. So here is a bit about. You know, here was a bit about like algorithm and things of the sort. Here, I kind of have some TED Talks that I found that are very, very interesting about women talking about this data world, dating, using dating app to find. So this first one is actually Amy Webb. I was lucky enough to actually attend this talk in person uh, at the UNC uh Women in Data Science uh, Conference last year at UNC. And... Um, this one is the one that she did for TED Talk. So I'm going to let you listen for a few of them. And of course, the source is there and the, you know, AUC initiative can share so you can listen to the rest. I've got a new plan. I'm going to keep using these online dating sites, but I'm going to treat them as databases. And rather than waiting for an algorithm to set me up, I think I'm going to try reverse engineering this entire system. So knowing that there was superficial data that was being used to match me up with other people, I decided instead to ask my own questions. What was every single possible thing that I could think of that I was looking for in a mate? So I started writing and writing and writing. And at the end, I had amassed 72 different data points. I wanted somebody who was Jew-ish. So I was looking for somebody who had the same background and you know thoughts on our culture, but wasn't going to force me to go to shul every you know Friday and Saturday. I wanted somebody who worked hard because work for me is extremely important, but not too hard. For me, the hobbies that I have are really just new work projects that I've launched. And here we have uh, Violet Lim. She's actually from the Philippines and she has actually, she's more of a matchmaker and she uses this concept of matchmaking and dating apps and, and you know, to kind of match up people. And here she has a very good talk. So let me, let's listen to some of it. Yes, I have come to realize that finding the right one is not just about meeting the right one. It's actually also about being the right one and choosing the right one. Are we the right one ourselves? Do we have the right mindset and the right skill set to meet the right one when he or she comes along? Ladies who come to our dating service, they usually ask for a guy who is 1.75 meters. It doesn't matter whether they are 1.5 meters or 1.7 meters. I remember asking this girl who is 1.5 meters, why do you need someone who is so tall? And this is her answer to me, Violet, you see, I want to be able to wear my six inches high heels and still be able to rest my head on his shoulder. So maybe this is what she meant. Ladies, you... So I've actually watched it, that Chinese drama. Uh, it's actually pretty good. So uh, I watch a lot of Chinese and Korean drama. So those are my enjoyments. So I thought it fun that she had that little tidbit in there. So um, I think that from these two ladies, I think that we understand that dating is not only about going on dating app or getting online to just uh, swipe right, swipe left or do things. You actually also, if you are really uh, interested in finding someone, you have to understand who you are and maybe figure out ways that you can use those dating apps to your advantage. So next, I'm going to give you kind of like my final thoughts on dating, uh, data and dating. So uh, what if you want to be successful, you have to understand what exactly is the desired outcome of your dating life. Because for some people, you know, they are particularly in a certain time of their life that where they just want to have fun. Other people's maybe they are getting getting ready to get married or they waiting until they have money to get married. So if what is your outcome right now? If you want to have a positive experience, it's highly likely that you're going to have it online, according to the data set, the data that the Pew Research gave us. Now, you have to find out what you value in yourself and in a future partner. 
then you have to have a bachelor degree or higher. You have to make at least $75,000 per year. Then you have to be truthful on your dating profile. At the end, you also have to be clear about what you are looking for. So now that you know those things, what do you think now, how can dating apps can help you? I think that it depends on the type of relationship that you want. Do you want a committed relationship? Do you want to have just casual dates? Or are you looking for hookups? Um, that's some things that people are looking for. So if you want a committed relationship, you can actually find your optimal match on Hinge. Hinge's algorithm is actually based on, on, on the stable matching problem, which is all about finding somebody who matches you perfectly. The casual dates, meaning you want to find an interesting match, go on things, go on that, Bumble will be there for you because at the end of the day, really, you the woman is actually starting the conversation. So which means that women usually have more things that they are looking for when they are on the dating app, right? And then you have hookups. So you can do uh, Tinder where, you know, it's all about that getting a high dating score. So, you know, it doesn't they talk about, oh, you can get this call by behaving like a high value person, but you can just pretend to be a high value person and just go on there and date as many people as long as you have a high dating score. You can actually pay on there and then get a high dating score. How do I then verify if you're a high value person? Then you have um, finding an attracting match that would be on Grindr because I don't know if just me opening an app and finding somebody who's nearby, uh, you know, like at five miles from me automatically because it fits some preference, this person is the match for me. But I'm not saying that it's impossible to find the people you are looking for on those dating apps. I think that there are many people who have found their life partner, uh, the love of their life and different things like that on these many different dating apps there. But I think it's very important to understand what you are looking for and what you want to happen in your dating life. That's pretty much all I have for today, Dr. Washington. Uh, thank you so much again for giving me the opportunity to talk to, uh, to you guys at the AUC Data Science Initiative. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insightful and delightful presentation. And thanks to everybody for completing the poll and the poll questions. So at this time, I believe the poll is closed and Tommy Taylor is going to do a readout of the poll results. Tommy? Yes, hello, hello. All right. Um... Well, first of all, thank you so much for the uh, amazing presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Namini. Um, I'm actually updating my dating profile right now. <laughs> so I'm going to get some matches. But um, since we are the Data Science Initiative, uh, we always love to collect data as well. So today in our uh, poll, I will do a little readout here. So um, today at, at for our Love Dating Algorithm Seminar, uh, we have about 19% of people who are actually students and we have 81% uh, who are who are already graduate or working professionals. So um, I think some people making that 75,000 or above might be in the room. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, For if we're a student, what level are you? So we have about 2% freshmen and the same amount for sophomores. Uh, no juniors or seniors today. Um, and we have 15% master students, 4% PhDs, and the remaining 78% are not students. So I think they're uh, working right now. Uh, so thank you for taking time off the job to get some valuable uh, dating advice. <laughs> uh, and today, the ladies outnumber the men, uh, 70 to 30%. Okay. And uh, we have about an equal distribution, about half people from Georgia and uh, the remaining from other parts of the United States and 2% international. So thank you all from all over the globe. We're, we're international now. Look at that. All right, and let's see. So we have a couple questions uh, uh, surround, surrounding the dating, online dating world. So we have our question here is, what percentage of Americans uh, use online dating? Uh, and let's see, so our our polls, we have about, let's see, 50% of our audience chose 40% uh, and then followed by 80. So um, Dr. Namin, do you know the correct answer? 
Yeah, the correct answer is 15%, but that was in 2019. Maybe he has changed now. I think he might have changed. We don't have the data yet for what happens during COVID-19. So this number may have probably changed. I think the 40% will probably be the closest to what we have now ah, since hey. COVID-19. You were spot but, on. That is uh, currently it's about 40% from the data I've gathered. Um, that's, that's that's a big jump in what, three, three, four years. Yes. Uh, 15 to 40. All right. And of course, we have to ask the doom and gloom question. What percentage of people lie on their online dating profiles? Um, and it seems like a lot of people have bad experiences. So we have uh, or lying themselves. They're being honest. Um, so the majority say 85 percent. Uh, so 39 percent of our audience say 85 percent people are lying. And then we have 37 percent that says 76. Um, Dr. Nami, do you have a. Do you have uh, a I guess? I can I can guess. I will say fifty three percent of people lie on their dating profile, but I I don't know. <laughs> this one is me oh. guessing. And I think that's also the, the same amount of people uh, who I say about fifty percent of the, uh, marriages end the divorce. So um, <laughs> that's actually the correct answer. So yes, fifty three percent, not seventy six or eighty five. Everybody's not lying, but about half of us are. So yes, that's pretty- exactly. <laughs> That's some pretty interesting data. So that is our uh, poll today. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for filling that out. And thank you for joining us. And now we're going to open the floor for our favorite part, which is uh, our question and answer section. So uh, Dr. Watson, take it away. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. So there's some really great, great questions in the Q&A. If anybody has questions, please put them there. The first one said, this is really good. And yes, great presentation. It seems that all of the information that these algorithms are created, they're using structured data sets and grouping as much overlapping data to create a match. My question is, how can these dating algorithms be designed to handle data that is unstructured, unstructured, and the answers are more varied. And that, that is where AI could come into play more or can data science answer these questions solely? Yes, I think that, uh, you know, data science, which is uh, unstructured data, which is actually the part of data science where I mostly reside, where you're trying to find a topic, uh, you know, kind of like clustering things, of course, me, I'm mostly cluster words, but cluster things. So first things that you're going to have to do is basically cluster these people, right, who are on the dating app and saying different things. Cluster them into the type of people who are looking for this, the type of people who are looking for that, and the type of people who are looking for this other thing. And as you can see, most of those dating apps actually ask you for preferences and, uh, you know, to understand who you are. Also, they take information about who you like, who you dislike, so that they can then go into those cluster and say, okay, she liked this person, she disliked this person, he liked this person, she disliked this other person, he likes this type of dating profile, therefore he likes the people in cluster one. I'm going to provide those people to him and he's going to be like, oh, pick those people. And the more you pick, the more your algorithm is understanding you. I mean, there are so many algorithms who are actually born, you know, not born, but made to understand and learn more from data. That's why, you know, you you want as many data as you can. That's why they want you to be on the dating app, because the more you give them data, the better the algorithm understands you. Great. What does it mean to reverse engineer the dating app? So data app, they ask specific questions. So how do I change that and ask the questions that I'm interested in knowing? I think that reversing the dating algor- algorithm is pretty ingenious. I think that her idea is very good. And the way she talks about it is very great. So basically what she's doing is actually that, and I think a lot of people do that. Um, so you understand what the dating app is looking for, right? And you know, I am looking for this specific type of person. Therefore, I have to behave in this specific type of way so that my profile can be shown to this specific type of person. And then we're going to match up and it's going to be perfect. So you can say things like, oh, because I have a PhD, I only want to talk to other PhD person because we understand already like, you know, just socially that 
uh, when you start in a relationship, it's better to have people who have the same kind of education level that you have, uh, regardless of what other people think, that's the best way to do it. So she probably will be like, oh, okay, I'm not going to choose somebody who doesn't have a PhD or something. And then she says, okay, I'm Jewish, therefore I'm going to put Jew. Uh, if you're not Jewish, don't come to talk to me. And then she's probably going to be like somebody who is interested in nerdy things, you know, uh, because she found her husband, he's also, you know, if you listen to the whole talk, she, she talks about how basically by doing those things, she was able to find her perfect match and they're married and I think have a child at least. Wonderful, really interesting. Um, and so somebody asked on the slide where you put things that help with finding a match, like annual salary degree and, and so on, does this information change based on gender? Um, I, on that part, I actually do believe that um, it, I, I don't know, like, I do not know, this is just my hypothesis at the moment, okay? So this is an hypothesis, but I think that depending on, I think it probably will change on race and gender, uh, but I think that in sociology even tells us that in order for you to have uh, somebody to find someone who is matched with you perfectly or who would be good for you will be somebody who shares your hobbies who have the same religious belief you guys on this have the same kind of background so that you guys are able to understand each other and have conversation without one person feeling that the other person is kind of um belittling them or gaslighting them right yeah, great, excellent points. So someone says, how does this data translate across race and gender? They said that they said they think that black women seem to think our situations are different, but what's the real story data wise? <laughs> So actually, I think that the real story data wise, and unfortunately, um, you know, um, <laughs> you know, the, the position of black women is totally very different because unfortunately, because of many racial bias, uh, many uh, racial, um, you know, sayings about black women, the, the mad black woman, the angry black woman. So most people, unfortunately, do not um, get, try to even match up with black women. You also have the fact that the male counterpart of black women who are black women who are black men usually do not actually want to go on dating app and talk to black women and then also at the other end you have black women who are also mostly interested to only dating black men so which make the situation a little bit uh, harder uh, because they have too many things going against them yeah it's, it's a complicated you know no no, no exact answers there so exactly. someone asked how do you convince people that doing online dating to me is more realistic on who they want to date? So maybe I'm not sure I understand the question, but the question, the I think that you know, as uh, you know, we saw earlier that according to 2019 data, right, 15 percent of people were doing things online, but now it's up to uh, to 40 percent, right? So it's because that with the world changing and things being just different. Uh, talking to people online, like this conference is actually virtual, right? And uh, I've had the pleasure to even get to know Dr. Washington virtually, okay? We we only, you know, all finally met in person uh, last year. So doing things online and finding people that you can meet and have great relationship online nowadays is just very much possible, whether it's a relationship, love relationship, a work relationship, a relationship with your student. As you can see, I even teach student at North Carolina State University, and I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. And my, my LinkedIn thinks I'm in Atlanta, right? So you see, everything is possible nowadays. So, um, you know, I think that people being open to dating online should be the best thing for them. And, you know, the world is getting virtual, unfortunately, that's the case. Nate, it's really interesting to see how the world has evolved in different ways with technology. So somebody is, um, they're, 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 I think I sense a bit of frustration in this, especially as we approach that day of Valentine's Day. <laughs> they say my other challenge is that you have to pay a fee to actually see or respond to potential matches. However, in the past year, this person has had no ROI 
no return on this monetary investment. It seems to this person that most dating apps are just trying to get money. Why should one invest when past experiences have not been that good? This person has a PhD, college administrator. They're in their 60s. And so it's not me, y'all. And the research is clear that African American females with college degrees are less likely to find a comparable match in the dating pool. What should one do with this frustration in this hardcore, crazy data driven app world? What to do? Yes, I think that um, I may know this person. person. But I think that the first thing that I will tell this person just personally is that they have to switch their mindset. If you come to the dating world because of your past experience, because you haven't had luck, I think the first thing you have to say is that I am going to find the person that I want and I do not care what has happened before. So like the second lady, the Violet Lim said, you have to change your mindset. You have to figure out what exactly am I looking for, who I am as a person and who I am finding. Now, first of all, you have to also think about that you don't have to put too many restrictions on yourself because you have to have an open field, right? If you know you don't have, if you want to restrict yourself to this small group of people, then it's going to be very difficult for you to find someone. So open yourself, then put down what you're looking for and set some boundaries on this new experience that you're looking for. And also try not to focus on superficial things uh, if you're looking for that person and go out there and just be open and see what happens. All about is a mindset. If you believe you're going to find someone, you're going to find someone. And if you find someone who's close enough, but they're not good enough, move on. It sounds like we can all create an algorithm where we can specify items and then we can actually provide weights to them. And then perhaps we can use some sort of predictor, corrector, model when people come by and and see how that works to really test out is it what we want in our algorithm, really what we want in dating. Sometimes what we think we want and what reality presents us don't match. Exactly. Yes. And then, of course, as you said, we set parameters. So I'm thinking from a model, we, we're setting parameters, and there's a bit of an optimization in there yeah. uh, to, to find a, a palatable experience. Yeah. And so somebody said, I find that educated Black men from certain geographic locations want different things. For instance, men I've met from the South are not looking for educated and successful women, they want a traditional woman. Traditional. I don't know what that means. I I mean, I don't cook. So anyway, um, men I've met from the Midwest and further have connected well with educated and successful women. Is that the norm or what does the data say about people who come from these different geographies across the nation? And how do we change the way we search? I think that really at this point of time, it just really depends on the culture and how you have grown up, uh, have you have your grown up and what you have learned throughout your experience. Right. So I think that most people have grown up a certain way and uh, believe certain things. Now, do you then decide to evolve and change your mindset or do you want to stay in that mindset and continue to look for those things? Now, unfortunately, today, women have found that that uh, they can earn their own money. Uh, they can they can buy their own houses uh they can you know make as much as men so they're not going to take anything when they go into a relationship regardless of if you have a phd and she only uh buses table uh at mcdonald's okay so you're gonna have to find ways to evolve as a man and of course meet the woman of today where she is yeah um excellent advice and to be open and so somebody's saying, you know, they, they want to start with a dating app and you gave the dating apps and the different preferences. If anybody needs to review these, they, this video right now is on our Facebook page. We put a link in the chat and we'll also be on our YouTube page next week. So it, it sounds like that when people are looking for these dating apps, they have to go on with some discernment and also some self-awareness. That's what, right. Where are you? What is it that you want? Come with some emotional intelligence. The the data can't be everything. It is helpful to make the match. It is helpful 
to, to give an idea about where and how things can go. But then there's that human factor, right? Chat PT, GPT, you can't GPT. replace everything, right? Yes. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that, you know, what you said is correct. There has to be some emotional intelligence. You cannot just rely on the algorithm because unfortunately algorithm at one point, um, I do believe that the algorithm itself will find out that humans are obsolete because we actually cost money because we need to breed hair and the, the environment is not getting any better. So you have to come to things with a certain uh, kind of emotional intelligence, understanding that you may have some things that you want in a partner and you have to figure out what are your five things that you cannot do with that. What are five things that you can say, okay, that's not good enough. And then you go on the dating app, very much putting things about like the education, maybe the race, the gender or whatever. And then it, the app is just now, what it's doing is just kind of filtering type of women that you or men that you're interested in. Then you get to meet these people, you figure out, do they meet those things that I have in my list? Yes or no? Can I get away? Can I compromise here if I find somebody that I think we could match? And then go from there. That's what I think should be the better approach to dating and love. Fantastic. And your, your insights are right on. Somebody said they accidentally dated internationally and it worked out. But I will say, for the record, uh, when you use these dating apps and in dating and relations, keep yourself safe. That's right. Exactly. Safety keep first. first. Definitely. Yes. You just, one never really knows on the other side who is there and what they are. So always have safety at top of mind. Uh, it, it could be fun, enjoyable, but you got to stay safe and you got to use discernment and um, good judgment. So uh, with that, I, I know, uh, I, I feel like I'm better positioned. You know, of course, I met my better half online. So, you know. What she says, I, I totally get it. You just never know who you'll meet, where you'll meet them. So just be open and, and have your algorithms ready and also flexible enough that they're not so stringent that you're weeding out any potentials, we'll say. Isn't that, yeah? Do you, and Melissa, do you have any final last um, data-driven words of wisdom in this as we go into this Valentine's Day full of love in our hearts? I think that uh, you should actually go on Valentine's Day by yourself, actually, because the most important thing for you is actually before you find somebody to love you or somebody you can love is actually most important that you love yourself. Me, myself, I actually go on Valentine's Day by myself. I do things. I look good. And I just take a bubble bath, you know wear nice clothes and I go to a restaurant or I buy things that I want because I want to know, understand that I love myself the most. And then whoever comes there is good. Fantastic words of wisdom. I know I'm going to have a nice quiet Valentine's day where we just make some food and just relax. So yeah. it, it can be fun. It can be enjoyable and everybody has their own unique experience. Thanks That's everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for sharing us for the me. words of wisdom super fun. And we hope to see everybody around. And yes, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And please, with all that you do, just stay safe, stay diligent, and enjoy the data because data is dope. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>